Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of the uh, Global Fact Conference. My name is Elena Dvorak. I'm the International Training Manager here at the International Fact Checking Network. Been at Pointer since 2018, and I just joined the team at the beginning of this year, working on a program uh, training aspiring fact checkers in 20 different countries across 13 languages around the globe. Some of them may, in fact, be in this session. Um, throughout the course of that program, I've actually had the pleasure of working with two of our panelists. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. Uh, first, we have Alex Mahadevan, who is a program manager at MediaWise. MediaWise is home to Pointer's team fact-checking network and also hosts media literacy training for teens through senior citizens. He has graciously helped me with my program all throughout the year developing self-directed coursework. He helped with some webinars, uh, and I'm looking forward to working with him even more in 2022. Next, we're joined by Malena Rosen, I'm going to mess that up, Rosenzbeet of Chegada, who heads the education program for this organization that works across Latin America. And lastly, we have Sluve Carlson, manager at Norway's FactSix. One of the FactSix programs, Tank, Tank helps develop teaching programs on critical media use and source awareness. Um, throughout the program, if you have any questions, I want you to feel free to put them in the Q&A section as you've been doing throughout the entire program. Um, we're gonna be following along, pull them out to ask our panelists. We really hope to get a good free flowing discussion here. But now I'm gonna pass it off to my uh, panelists so that they can talk a little bit about some of their favorite programs that they've worked on this year. So first I'm gonna hand it off to Alex so he can tell you more about one of his 2021 programs, MediaWise for Seniors. Thank you, Elena. I am uh, very glad and happy to be here. I enjoyed the program uh, all day yesterday and I'm having a lot of fun. So um, yeah, so taking it a little bit back in 2020 MediaWise, which is a digital media literacy program that was originally aimed at teaching teens to separate fact from fictions, expanded to include college students and first time voters. That was at the beginning of 2020. The idea was there's going to be a lot of misinformation in the ramp up to the 2020 election. And we wanted to empower first time voters to go to the polls confident in the decisions they were making. In March though, I was actually in New York City for a MediaWise Voter Project event that happened a week before the NBA here in the US shut down. And that was really the, I think the wake up call in the US that um, the pandemic was clearly engulfing the country and really, misinformation about COVID-19 was so rampant that we knew we had to jump on it and we knew we had to do something. So first we directed our team fact checking network, our group of young fact checkers to pitch and take on Instagram stories about the coronavirus. Um, they did a ton of work teaching folks their age, kids their age, um, how to fact check on their own, especially when it came to um, misinformation during the pandemic. But then we aggressively rolled out our MediaWise for Seniors program. Um, we did that knowing that the 50 plus population in the US was particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 misinformation. And that's because they have more time on their hands, they have more disposable income, they're more vulnerable to scams, and they're new to technology and generally the most civically engaged. Uh, they have the highest population uh, percentage that votes. They were just prime targets for misinformers. Um, and then plus, given the, the state of the pandemic, the older population was just most at risk health-wise. So the, in this Media Wise for Seniors program, we partnered with AARP uh, and with support from Facebook, we launched virtual seminars. We created an online course that thousands of seniors have taken to learn how to do reverse image searches. They learn how to understand algorithms and do their own fact checking on their own social media feeds. We basically teach older adults, as we have been doing for years with teens and first time voters, how to think like a fact checker, like you all here. We were lucky enough to welcome former Good Morning America co-host Joan London and CNN chief international correspondent Christiane Amanpour as ambassadors. And they, along with NBC's Lester Holt and other big name journalists, literally teach MediaWise for senior students how to fact check on their own in our How to Spot Misinformation online course. The Stanford Social Media Lab studied that course and they found that it significantly improved the ability for folks who take it to separate fake from real headlines. Um, and that was very encouraging to us because in just 90 minutes 
in that course, we're able to help enrolled people become better digital citizens. That course is available for desktop, computer, and mobile. And like I said, we've had thousands take it so far. So uh, along with that, we've actually got a town hall with the AARP coming up uh, just next week in which tens of thousands of seniors in the U.S. are calling in by phone to learn some of those same things that, that we just discussed. Uh, they're they're going to learn about how and why misinformation spreads, how to fact check, and uh, they're even going to learn how to talk to others who spread misinformation. Um, that is something that's very important. We're really trying to restore civil discourse. And, you know, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the future. Um, and with the support of Facebook, we're taking this program international in 2022. We uh, hope to be creating innovative digital media literacy courses like we've discussed delivered via WhatsApp. We'll have more to share in the coming months, but for now I can say we hope that these new WhatsApp courses can meet those who need our lessons most where they interact online. So we're continuing to reach new audiences on new platforms to stop the spread of misinformation. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, now we're going to move on to Sulve. Uh, if you want to talk about some of the uh, one of your programs from 2021, I know that you you guys focused a lot on targeting teachers and students. Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, our program started in, in 2019, and, and, and the beginning was actually that FACTISK, which is the fact checkers in Norway, uh, had started to see that in the schools they need more, um, uh, more fact checks, actually. Uh, and the problem for this is that uh, we, for a long time we thought that students in Norway actually were like not used to uh, how to work online. And uh, could separate different information. But the problem we saw on tests was that when they saw that information seems to be uh, uh, good or nice looking, they would say that this is good, uh, good, good information. And and in the beginning, we just got uh, support from uh, some from pri private funds. But in the summer 2020, we got support actually from the government uh, through the state budget. Uh, and we were looking into schools and see what what can we we offer for the schools because uh, the original idea was to travel around Norway, which is not that big. You in the U.S. has a much much bigger audience, and a lot of other countries uh, has as well. But um, but we saw that um, even though Norway is not that big, it's hard to reach all the corners of the country. So we had to go online, and very early we we launched our uh, websites. And, um, and made them so that the teachers can use it. In Norway, we got a new curriculum in uh, 2019, uh, which focused on critical thinking and media literacy much more than before. Um, and it seems like uh, this could be very useful to, you, to, uh, to build on for us. So our website is, is uh, aiming for the teachers so they can use it almost as a textbook and uh, read for themselves and then give uh, the spe special um, websites for the students. In the classrooms, it's uh, also so that the teachers want us to, to join them. Um, and uh, uh, we couldn't as the schools closed down and some of the schools was, was hard to visit uh, during Corona time. So then we started with digital, uh, digital lessons uh, addressing to each classroom. Uh, and some of them, we got a lot of schools, probably around five, five different schools joining each class. And we have for, for children, we have for youth school, and we have for what we say high school. And uh, when we were working on this, we, we, we brought with us fact checkers who can talk with the students. And we made, them, uh, made all the lessons interactive so the students can, can use their mobile phones during, during the, the lessons. But our main uh, way to get to teachers and, and uh, students was through our web pages, where we created topics like disinformation, fake news, graphics and numbers, social media, conspiracy theories, fact checkers, who's behind the information, homeschooling, election USA 2020 actually came up. Uh, but we had to see that this page has to be more, more uh, innovative and easy to use for students and, and uh, teachers. So we actually built the uh, uh, new web page, which could be used for, for students. And all of this was built on this curriculum uh, where we, who we got in Norway. 
Um, and in every uh, teaching lesson, we we um, we built in these um, goals from the from the curriculum, and then the teachers could just uh, knock off their what their needs for the classes, and they don't have to take like okay, this hour is going to be just for fact checking. Now this class can also uh, contain some of the goals we we anyway have to cover. Uh, during this time, we also uh, um, had had a video team joining us, so we can can create videos for like one and a half to two minutes, showing the points, and it's easy to to uh, to bring to the classroom. The students page is like it's like an, an uh, a task task book, which you probably all of you use when you were in school, uh, where the teachers get their lessons, get their uh, tasks, and can solve them for themselves. At the same time, the teacher has their own page where they can. Uh, uh, get some tips like where to go, what to, to say now, how to bring the discussion in the class further. Uh, and all the way, we also used um, like uh, up to date news from the web, like from CNN, from Norwegian broadcasts, and stuff like that. So the students had to use the same thing as they meet in the daily life. We all were also really, um, uh, we, we had to, to be sure that what uh, what we bring into the school also was the same as they met in their normal life outside school. So we, for example, had them to fact check influencers or uh, commercials or other things that they will meet in the daily life. So to, to, to uh, avoid that they have a, a separate world in the classroom than they have in the normal life. Uh, so somebody asks, how, how was the success? Well, as we can measure we have a lot of more traffic on the websites during Corona time. Um, in the start, we had almost uh, around 15,000 page views each uh, month. Uh, but uh, but when, we when we launched a new page, uh, we were almost having 30,000 uh, page views during one month. And actually last month, we, we launched a new topic, which is called 22nd of July and radicalization, which is uh, it's now 10 years since we had a, a terror attack in Norway, killing almost uh, 80 uh, youth in Norway on an island. Uh, and that was a real terrible accident and uh, a lot of teachers don't want to talk about it actually. So now we have youth uh, growing up who hasn't heard about it and don't know what happened. And then we had to learn again. And then we used a documentary from Factisk and uh, put it in the classroom and, and uh, made it more suitable for, for youth. Uh, this documentary was really short. It was five short documentaries for 10, uh, 10 minutes, um, each of them, so they can uh, have it in the classroom. All of this uh, is what we do. We kind of like connect the fact checkers to the classroom and all who works in Tank, which is Think in English, uh, our teachers. So we uh, work with the fact checkers to create um, materials who can work with the teachers and in the classroom. Thank you so much for that. Um, do we have Milena with us or are we still having some tech difficulties? No. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to some questions. So first, um, I'd like to kind of propose a question for both of you, but we'll start with Alex. Alex, you've trained teens and kind of an older crowd, so to speak. Uh, so kind of what's the difference between, if any, between training uh, younger people versus training some, some older folks? You know, is one easier, harder? Um, do you approach it differently? First, I, I do want to apologize. I hope you can hear me a little bit better now because uh, I had some audio issues and I promise you if we were in person, you would hear me. I think Elena can agree. I've got uh, quite a loud, annoying voice. So um, really, really good question. Um, and as we transitioned so quickly to roll out the MediaWise for Seniors program, we learned very quickly that uh, older folks do learn a little differently. Um, but first and foremost, I do want to say the foundational principles that we teach are the same. You know, the three questions developed by the Stanford History Education Group. Um, we teach teens and college students and now older people. When you see something online, ask who's behind the information, what's the evidence, and what are other sources saying? Just the foundation of thinking like a fact checker. 
really, you know, the idea in general of thinking like a fact checker rings true and works for anyone of any age. Um, but, you know, as you alluded to, there is uh, quite a bit of a difference. And uh, I found that for older people, starting with the discussion and explanation of algorithms is the best way to open them up and get them to start thinking a little bit deeper about what they see online. Um, while you might think algorithms, okay, you might be thinking algorithms are very uh, a heady topic to be trying to teach um, folks who may have just gotten their first iPad. Um, but you'd be surprised. Um, the uh, 50 plus folks that I teach pick up on algorithms very quickly. And when they understand that what they see on their social media feeds is there for a reason. Um, you really pop the hood on social media platforms. They immediately become more informed internet users. And they're immediately able to ask those three questions because every time they're browsing the internet, they're not just scrolling anymore. They're thinking a little bit deeper. So for older people, definitely starting with algorithms, that stops them right away. For teens, you know, I'm, uh, teens spend a lot of time on TikTok and uh, they they understand how algorithms work because I think TikTok of all social platforms shows very transparently how 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 the algorithm sort of suck, can suck you in in a way. Um, so we focus more on the impact of misinformation. Here's why sharing misinformation hurts you. Here's how it hurts your loved ones and your community and, you know, platforms very widely. I mentioned TikTok. I'm not teaching older folks how to use TikTok. We spend a lot of time on Facebook and Nextdoor, which uh, is sort of a, a, a neighborhood social media app here in the U.S. that's quite a hoot to hang out on. It, it's something, all right. Um, <laughs> you can spend a lot of time there. So, hey, you talked a little bit about how you uh, work with both middle schoolers and high schoolers so that, you know, two different youth age groups. Um, do you have a different approach for, for different age groups for young people? Well, we haven't done so much for the young people because we're not having the budget for it. But one of the challenges is that mon many of them don't, uh, don't join social media. So you can't just go in the classroom and, and thank, take it for granted that everybody knows what is uh, TikTok and, and Instagram and so on. Uh, actually, we've been also been working with uh, older people too. And and I agree with Alex that that start start with the technical part and give them give them a look under the hood and, and see how it works. Uh, but still, the youth and 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 um, the the younger uh, kids needs to have tools. And and I have to to uh, to give an extra extra thumbs up for this uh, lateral reading, which we have moved into the Norwegian discourse and and used a lot because that's really effective and and uh, and youth really understands it because. What you really need working with youth is that they have to have some kind of short checklist. And on the checklist, they need to have some tools. Uh, in, in the classroom, uh, it is a really good help for the teacher to have tools to say, OK, do the, do the reverse uh, um, picture uh, uh, research or, or do the lateral reading and, and stuff. And then it's really easy for the students to kind of move outside the text or outside the source because that's the main uh, difficult part with m doing fact checking. It's not being being misled by by the source and and see oh this is really nice. It has to be true. But if you take a step back, you can see it. Okay, this this source has not really good uh, uh, or have, haven't found the, the the right way to use their facts. And I will say, having done several webinars with Alex at this point that people love playing with the tools. They love having an active way that they can they can do fact checks. So we have a great question from Jane that I'd like to propose to both of you. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges to getting people to effectively do their own fact checking? How do you get people to do it? Um, and how do you measure success? What does it look like for each of you in your individual projects? Either of you can jump in. It's you know. Well, well, if I can take first of it, uh, uh, I've been working as a teacher for fourteen years, and and uh, and um, <laughs> kind of uh, looking at commercials with a critical uh, critical mindset. You can work like two hours with the students, and everybody said, "Okay, this is how commercials works," and I will not go for the tricks again. And as soon as they leave the classroom, they they see a commercial for co for Coca Cola, and they, oh, I want a Coke. So it's really hard to, to, to manage them to work outside the classroom. Uh, 
Um, so I think that what we really have to do is give them the tools and, and make the tools as, uh, as specific as possible. So, so they, they, they can have it. And, and you also make posters. So they have like five checkpoints so they can go through and, and uh, if they see a thing. And, and very often we talk with them, when you see some information and you, and, and you kind of get surprised, then you should check it. So working on this, this feeling kind of, but also we, we, we often say uh, you will get fooled sometimes, but uh, try to have a little resistance and this talk with your friends and say, well, how, where did you get this from? Not, not like a critical question, but more, more like a content contest to, 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 to be a detective and find the source. That's great, Salve. Um, so for us and for me uh, personally, I, I know I came into the project back in 2019 thinking the biggest challenge was going to be, well, you know, how, how am I going to get Gen Z to care? You know, I, I was naively, I naively thought that this was a, a, a pretty nihilistic generation, which they are not. They care deeply about the world around them. So the biggest challenge was just helping them understand that when they see a website, uh, maybe a website that uh, um, is supposedly giving them information about uh, climate change um, and uh, to help them understand that there might be somebody behind that website who has some sort of bias or motive for sharing that information. So basically helping them understand that you can't take everything you see online at face value, which, you know, just speaking anecdotally from, from teaching thousands of students in person back before the pandemic, um, they sort of do take things at face value. They grew up with iPads in their hands. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, my nieces and nephews, I, I used to make fun of my brother because it was like they'd toss an iPad to him and it was, you know, they could spend two hours on it. So I think they, they were exposed to the internet so much that they really didn't, didn't understand necessarily that they could be fooled. And in terms of uh, measuring success, we look at reach. Um, so for the seniors program, we've reached more than 600,000. Actually, it's more than 700,000 with um, all sorts of memes. We've done PSAs. We've done our course. And then um, for college students, I just did want to bring up engagement too. We, we put together a text message-based course um, during the election that had an 87% completion rate. So um, college students, first time voters were completing this course on their phone and learning how to fact check. Um, and as many of you guys know, if you've participated in any sort of online trading, an 87% completion rate is absolutely astounding. Um, I've been working in e-learning for almost four years and having completion rates that high is, is very impressive indeed. Um, we have another question from one of our audience members. Uh, are we eligible as fact checkers and media organizations to train teenagers and teachers as a whole, the, as the whole fact checking community, where are we pushing authorities to make critical digital literacy mainstream? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I don't, you guys can chime in as well. I don't know if anyone is eligible necessarily. I think it's you know, are you qualified? I think you guys certainly are, but um, feel free to chime in about how we can push um, people to make digital literacy more mainstream. Well, I, I think fact checkers are absolutely qualified. Uh, anyone, any anyone here who is part of a fact checking organization is absolutely qualified. And honestly, um, you are the best teachers. The the best way to teach media literacy is through real world examples and real world transparency about how you fact check something. Show them how you did a reverse image search. Show them how you looked at the source code behind a web page or used Wayback Machine. Um, that is really the best teaching. So honestly, fact checkers are positioned to be some of the best educators in media literacy. I know in the U.S., um, there is a push to make media literacy in some way, shape, or form part of our high school curriculum. So you would um, high school students would have to take this uh, in some form. So I know there is a, a, a slight push for that here. Um, I think it, it's just um, I think the the news industry as a whole is um, always looking for resources. So it, it may be hard sometimes to devote resources toward digital media literacy, because the thing is, fact checks um, feel like they have more uh, immediate impact. 
you are fact checking something, you are seeing engagement in that fact check. Whereas digital media literacy has a longer term, but I would argue bigger impact because you are planting that seed and you are empowering people to be their own fact checkers. My, my, my experience also is that uh, students often feel that they get, as you said, uh, Alex, they, they feel empowered by, uh, by getting these tools. They don't need to be, be led by all the information and all those uh, voices they can, they can experience through their feed uh, on different social media platforms. For many of the, my students, I can see that they, 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 they come to this point where they say, how can I tell what is true? And this this why sounds nice. This one sounds nice. Who is the right one? How can I how can I separate them? And and a lot of teachers also feel kind of like uncomfortable uh, talking about this because uh, in Norway we have a, a discourse where uh, you have the far right telling that oh you're you're taking away my freedom of speech and blah blah blah. And and uh, and teachers of course don't want to want to have have a bias. But we all do have. But as soon as we focus on the tools and and uh, they can use the tools for free, I, I can see that more of the students and more of the teachers actually think that, OK, this is a way to avoid being having a bias. Um, but still, um, I think that when 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 teachers can work together with fact checkers, that would be the best way to, to do it, because teachers know how to work with kids. The, and and fact checkers and media people knows how to 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 um, to speak in in a media way, which is really really important to understand. Um, so so the the cooperation between those those have been really uh, good in Norway. And and do you guys think? I mean, you know, in, in talking about integrating digital media literacy. Um, you know, what effort does training the teachers? I know, Silva, you talked about how you guys have trained teachers. I mean, I certainly don't think necessarily that all teachers, right, have the same digital media literacy skills that we need them to have in order to teach this. So um, what role do you think that plays in getting media literacy um, training for youth, the, just the skill set that our teachers have? No teacher does not have these skills at all. Uh, and, and part of it is that they don't have the, the self-confidence either. So they stand there and say, OK, we don't know. We don't know how the teachers, the, the students more, know more than us. Well, that's not really the true truth of it. But, but we have to empower them just by telling them that you know something. As a, as a teacher, you know how to, to check your sources. You know how to, to, to find information like in a book. And if you can start at that point, it actually helps. But we also know that, um, I guess this is a problem in, in all over the world, that, that uh, schools are a little slower in the organization because they have to, you know, knowledge can change from day to day. But the media goes really fast and, they, uh, and also you have trolls and, and, uh, and other organizations spreading disinformation and they will actually work to get better of spreading it. So you have to develop all the time. And this is uh, actually a message that uh, that both government in Norway, but also the teacher organizations uh, are into and understands and agree with us. Question as it relates to, to kind of public education. Um, and I don't know if necessarily either of you guys have direct experience with this, but um, oftentimes governments are the source of myths and disinformation. And if they're funding these programs in schools, how do you navigate what can be uh, a tenuous or tricky situation? Well, you do so on the front end. Um, any Anytime you enter a relationship with a funder, whether it's a government, whether it's um, you know, a philanthropist um, or other organization, on the front end, you have to be extremely clear about the editorial independence of your organization, which media-wise, we are um, militantly uh, nonpartisan, non-political, and we maintain editorial control over um, all of our content. So um, that is the first step. Uh, when it comes to, um, you know, I mean, the, the question is how how to even access public schools when some of the governments, maybe in other parts of the world, are spreading mis and disinformation. That's difficult, and um, you know, I, I can only I can only speak if I saw that ha something like that happening in the U.S. Um, what I would try to do is reach out to civic organizations and try to get in front of people um, through 
uh, I don't know, churches, for example, or other community organizations, um, if you are getting pushback from um, one area where you want to get digital media literacy training, you can always look to another area. Hmm. I also see in Norway that we have uh, local parents who are really critical to us. And they say that, uh, oh, you're so biased and they want to see what we are telling the children. For example, we had one, one parent who, who was really afraid that we would uh, have some anti-Trump propaganda in the classroom. So we just talked with him, showed him uh, what kind of slides we would use, and he just silenced and, and, and saw that mainly we were working on those who are trying to, to, uh, to, um, uh, yes, to, to get money from, from, from people. So, so uh, in that way, they are, if we focused more on like the techniques who are used and give examples that everybody uh, experienced, both light, left and right, it, that is more, much more, um, then we have more, more support from, from different communities and different people. But sometimes, I have to ask Alex actually, because, because we have some challenges in Norway uh, when we tell that we, we cooperate with Facebook and everybody says, that, oh, Facebook is the really big guy and bad guy here. How can you cooperate with them? And, and all money has strings attached. So how do you do that? You're just very transparent. Um, I mean, we're, we are very transparent with who our funders are. Um, if you go to um, uh, MediaWise's landing page on the Pointer website, you can see our, um, our editorial standards. Um, so we are very clear in, in um, you know, what, what we produce, how we produce it. I think all you can do is try to be transparent and explain to, um, explain to folks that, um, you know, there are lots and lots of very large companies in the world and, um, you know, different parts of them fund different objectives. And um, what we are doing is um, we are using the resources we have and we're trying to make a difference and we're transparent about where those resources come from and i'll tell you what we do the best that we can do um, to make an impact and we've seen it i brought up the stanford survey um, that showed our, our course was making a difference i've seen it in the kids faces you know back when we were able to teach in person um, so you know when people bring that up i just i you can just sort of show it to them you know put it in front of them this is what we produce um, here's the impact we've had and, um, you know, as long as you're transparent, you really can never go wrong. And I mean, that's the key in the fact checking world and journalism at large is transparency. Mm. Very, very good. And I see, I see, I also see that when we, we go out and, and when we show that, for example, you can just do a fact check and then, and then they start asking, oh, how can I tell that you are doing the right thing? Well, I say, you can do it yourself. Here you can see how we, how we do it. How, it, how does it work? And then they get these, and 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 then that that is actually really a good weapon to to get uh, um, the confidence from from people. And how do you guys go about? I don't want to say persuading funders, right? But someone in our questions and comment section, as well as something that you said earlier, Alex, um, it can be a little bit of a longer process to demonstrate media literacy, right? It, it's not always as immediate uh immediate of a situation so how do you guys navigate uh gaining that funding um you know uh given the relatively longer time window it might have to make a difference well in norway we kind of uh, run for open doors <laughs> because they they really understand the the impact of, of fact checking um, but but also we can see that uh, if we we have we have to be in the game for a long time, as Alex said that that uh, uh, when we sh can show results that we have reached out and and when we now launch our new website which we have put a lot of money in and it works for the teachers, the teachers likes it, um, they they use it and 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 give give thumbs up to us and and to colleagues. Then they start to spread the words, uh, but you have to stay a long time in the run, and you have to be uh, kind of like the same thing. You 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 can't just change, and and you you have to be careful how to how you you pair up with different kind of uh, sources. That's great insight. Um, 
For us, funders love data. Um, I, I know that the idea of media literacy may not seem as uh, sexy maybe to um, other things that funders might be um, uh, uh, giving money toward, but there is data there and that's what we try to highlight. So for example, um, our teen fact checking network, uh, they did, they do amazing work uh, now on YouTube and TikTok, but um, they started on Instagram. And, and we found through um, a, a survey that uh, more than 80% of um, teens who are watching these Instagram stories were more likely to fact check their feed. So um, finding new ways to gather data, we did that just within Instagram. We partnered with Stanford to study our How to Spot Misinformation course. Um, you highlighted a challenge that this is a, uh, it's a long-term and it's a growing field. Um, it's a growing research field. So there's not a whole ton of research out there. The research that is out there is very positive about the impact that media literacy training um, can have. So uh, what we do is we highlight past data, but then a lot of times when we are talking to um, uh, when we are when we are pitching funders or we are looking at projects, research is uh, a pretty crucial component of those projects now because we are um, trying to contribute to the um, to to the field of research around misinformation. In 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 Norway, also we see. I don't know if you see the same, Alex, but when we travel around talking about uh, and actually when Factisk also is traveling around telling that. Uh, they are creating uh, teaching resources. It's a selling point uh, when you meet different kind of uh, uh, investors because they really uh, think that it's important to work with young generations. Um, and Alex, you mentioned, which I thought was just a great technique. Um, you know, you mentioned that in um, in writing or reporting on fact checks, integrating methodology to kind of help teach that digital literacy. Um, what do you guys think are other ways that these fact-checking organizations, of which we have many who are watching right now, can integrate digital media literacy for their audiences? Well, I just what you just said, um, making sure to include the process of fact-checking within your fact-checks, um, call it out. Uh, I'm just like, I am just spitballing off the top of my head, but you could put almost like a pull quote or a, a box or something in the story, like media literacy tip. Here's, here's where we use lateral reading to fact check this. So you can integrate them within the fact check themselves. Um, trying to get your fact checkers out as community liaisons. Um, I try to speak at local events or as part of chambers of commerce, trying to get, get your face out there. Um, the other approach would be just housing resources on your website. So maybe you're just, maybe just like, just experiment, mess around with it, record a YouTube video that walks through how you did a reverse image search to fact check a claim. Just do it. I mean, just, just take like half a day, record a video and, uh, embed it on your website and then see what happens. Um, so you can sort of start adding your own media literacy, um, uh, resources as you go and sort of. Um, play around with how those work. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and I have to add, uh, you have to have a great team around you. <laughs> so, so if you have a lot of people, because if you're the only one, uh, it's kind of hard to reach all the 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 places you want to be, all the people. Uh, and in in uh, in my team, we have both uh, uh, people who work with uh, like mathematics and stuff like that. We have social science. We have language. So we have different skills in the school so we can reach both when we visit the school, but also when we create uh, different learning materials, it could fit into different subjects. And all of our uh, fact checkers or um, of media literacy uh, uh, learning re uh, resources is connected to uh, specific subjects. So then when you have different kind of uh, people on your team, you can use them uh, to different uh, meetings. Um, and do you guys have a different approach? Someone mentioned um, in the question section, uh, really kind of more complex disinformation uh, related things like uh, COVID related blogs on Substack or I assume Medium as well probably has a lot of those really complex misinformation. Uh, and they list uh, sources that may seem credible 
Um, is there an approach that you guys have for that or any tips that you guys have in your programming? It is a, it's, it should be a larger part of our programming and we're, we're working on that. It's, there's so much to pack into media literacy um, that it, it's sort of hard to cover everything. And what you brought up is a really great point understanding data and understanding how um, uh, research and research papers work. Um, so I, I am a, a former data journalist, so I'm very interested in how charts can lie, uh, how uh, margin of errors can completely uh, be hidden and polls can be used to deceive. Um, so I think there is a space for explaining how charts can lie. Um, I think that's the most basic way that you can teach a little bit more advanced um, uh, fact checking skills um, that you can just literally just start with talking about how the y axis that left side of the graph can be cut off to uh, to tell a lie and then just explaining to people how you know the process that goes into a research paper being published and going back to that lateral reading and who's behind the information to understand how to find a um, a credible journal where that research has been published and, and I think just to add my own my own two cents on that, I think we also need to do a better job of making sure journalists understand data. Um, you know, even we've done at Pointer, we've done a lot of work with APOR, which is a, a polling group. And I don't know how many times I see a headline where, you know, a margin of error is plus or minus two, it's 48 to 46, and they say a guy has a lead. No, he doesn't have a lead. It's a, it's a dead heat. Um, so I think... I think as journalists, we also need to do a better job of understanding the data ourselves. Um, we often focus on on how to get the answer, not having the answer, because uh, then you can also say that okay, media also do mistakes, uh, and and sometimes you can screw up as a teacher because every time we we all of us do mistakes. But the the the, the most important part is that. Okay, if we do mistakes, we have to to uh, to fix it afterwards. And and concerning graphics, we actually had to to do some some uh, specific uh, learning resources on graphics because this is really a big problem in Norway. And when you work with with kids, you have to to start really low on the level. You 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 don't need to go for the top. Just take the start and and make them start to question things. And, and sometimes think that, okay, this is in the newspaper. It might be something wrong here. Not that you all the time think that the newspaper might be wrong, but that you can have this, okay, if I start to wonder, could this be wrong? Well, check it. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And I think it's I think it's also just really important for us to be transparent in that way, to to you know maintain transparency as fact checkers, as people trying to promote digital literacy. Um, as you said, Slovay, like sometimes we get it wrong too. It's it's part of growing and, and having kind of that that iterative process. Um, we're starting to get ready to wrap up. So I would like to thank our panelists for joining us. I'd also want to bring attention to the chat. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists, Milena, was having some technical difficulties here, um, but she did put some of her contact information in the chat. Um, so that if you would like to reach out to her to learn about some of Chicago's programs, uh, which have run um, in Argentina and across other Latin American countries, I certainly encourage you to do so. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with them for the last year. Um, and so they have They've really done some, some good work. They have an education department that Milena heads. Um, uh, I also, please reach out to IFCN, or I'm sure both of our, both our friends here would love to reach out if there's any possibility to collaborate. Um, I know for both Silva and Alex, there were some, some people in the chats uh, asking about how they can possibly work with you guys in the future. Um, and I know all of us are all really passionate about growing and expanding and you know, increasing media literacy around the world because, you know, we're sort of at war with this and misinformation and we all need to work as, as hard as we can to, to help. Um, and certainly, uh, if you would like to contact me, as I said, I'm the International Training Manager here. Love to work with any and all of your organizations. Um, a replay for this session should be available shortly. I appreciate all of your questions and you guys tuning in. And I want to remind everyone we still have one more day. Well, more than one day, but 
to join in tomorrow. We will launch off bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, our first panel discussion is going to be about what the fact-checking community wants from YouTube, and that'll be moderated by Full Facts, Phoebe Arnold. Should be a good one. Um, I appreciate you guys again joining, um, and I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Um, and thank you once again to my fantastic panelists. Thank you for fostering a great discussion. Um, see you all tomorrow.